if you listen very carefully, you can hear the sound of the elves snoring. They've all gone to bed. They are up very late, celebrating Christmas Eve, ready to feast and party today. But they like to listen to what humans are getting up to during the day. So they've left their ears on the trees. So I'm out to gather some to make my favourite recipe. And that is stuffed jelly ear. So let me show you how to do that. And you might want to make it as a little starter for Christmas dinner or Boxing Day dinner or any time dinner. So let's enter the realm of the jelly ear. They're often these quite mossy, tangled, twisted, kind of witchy places. Lots of elder, of course. And you don't really have to look very far. I must say, started off with what looks like a prime candidate for stuffing. Because I would say that it's really in December that this recipe becomes worthwhile. Because when you're gathering lots of jelly ear, I think really only about one in 50 are perfect enough for stuffing. And perfect means they need to be about that size. I mean, this is how I like to do it. They need to be completely intact and yeah, of a, a good shape and easily rubbable. So, I'll, well, I'll show you the rubbing later when we've got some more, how we rub it to kind of open the two sides to make it suitable for stuffing. Look at this, even more tangly and witchy and elderly. Ah, oh, some great ones here. And I can see the frosty edge to them. And really you have to admire, respect and appreciate a fungi that can completely desiccate, dry out and then rehydrate and carry on growing. And Similarly, one that can completely freeze and thaw out and then carry on growing. Look at this. Listen in here. Completely frozen. It's kind of interesting. It was a situation like this. Uh, because you can see, look, does that remind you of anything? The way that breaks. So there's a situation like this about 15 years ago at this time of year. Maybe it was Christmas Day like today, I don't remember. But uh, just seeing them break like this reminded me of a, a thin coating of chocolate. And it was that, amongst other things, that led me to uh, rehydrate ones in orange juice and ribena and dip them in dark chocolate and give them to children on courses and then later develop that into uh, rehydrating in Grand Mernier or slow gin that I've made or cherry brandy, these kind of things. It's uh, one of those things that in the realm of the niche realm of <laughs> people that gather wild fungi and like to experiment but really kind of took off. And I see lots of people doing many variations each year which is always lovely to see. That one, that one's been pooped on. I think I might leave that one unless it is a perfect one for our purposes. We should see. But there's plenty more around here that don't have poop.
So the basket is filling up quite quickly, but you know, I've gonna change what I said, at least on this occasion, sometimes it, it is what I said before, but on this occasion, I reckon it's probably one in 200 that's kind of gonna be suitable for stuffing. I mean, look at this, that's just too much of a tangled on mass variable shaped lot. Uh, this, good size, but too, too cup shaped, too bowl shaped, whatever you want to call it. Uh, various things like that. And uh, so when you do find one, so this is looking pretty perfect. The other thing is to really keep it completely intact. So don't just kind of rip it off. So I'm gonna make sure take it off right close to the trunk without damaging it. So there we are. Hopefully that's a good one. Although, yeah, no, that's a, gonna be a good one. Look at my wonderful nail. Looks perfect, but I've already observed something that actually look a little hole so they have to be completely intact That's enough they're starting to thaw out in the sun now time to head home here we are back in the kitchen i've selected the potentially good jelly here so come and have a look and uh, so see the different sides you've got the kind of more velvety side and the underside and uh, so what you want to do is just give it a rub like this give it a rub until this side starts to separate from the other side and it's easier to rub on that side because this one's a bit kind of waxy you get a better kind of grip this side you can do it in any way that works and I have to say it isn't working this is this is this is real life it isn't working because it's too waxy and I can't hold it normally it does so I'm gonna do it yeah that's it Got a better grip on it now. That's it. So I can feel that these two sides of the mushroom opening. Now I've now I've got it going. I can do it. And essentially, we're creating a a hollow pocket inside. And you'll see what that's like in a minute. Right to the edges, but being careful not to be too vigorous at the edge or you split it. I guess it's like a, a giant bit of a ravioli. So have a look now. So you can see these two sides come apart like that. And now we're gonna fill that cavity with delicious things. So let's gonna have a look at what I'm gonna put in there. So, got some dehydrated cherry tomatoes and some dried Lita sedulus, seps, porcini, and some parsley. So I've blitzed up the uh, tomatoes and the mushrooms, and I'm just gonna add that to some full fat cream cheese, which I've put a bit of salt and pepper in there already. Let's put it all in, why not? And, bit of parsley. Mix that all together. And then we're gonna pipe it into the mushroom. So we got a few here, got four, so they're all separated. There we are. And I said earlier that kind of ones that were very, cup shape like this 
like that weren't really suitable mm -hmm. but I've only made this recipe a few times and I always selected ones that were much more disc shaped but actually this works because once you've separated it all it doesn't really matter it was cup shaped look at that big sack right so next stage is we need to make a small incision where we're going to pipe in not too big there we are and then I've put all my cream cheese and herbs and tomatoes into a piping bag kind of made up this nozzle because I didn't have a good one but actually this one works even better so I'm going to put that in there and we're going to pipe away squeeze look you see it filling up it's going to be quite a big one this one right down in there <laughs> look at it coming out the piping bag <laughs> <laughs> but anyway it's working ah. what I decided to do on this one is make I made the the mixture really quite thick wow actually I think that's enough Out there. take it to the edges All right. I'll just do the rest and then I'll show you the next stage. So there they are, all stuffed and ready to go. Still some separation going on there. I would say is when you are doing this, make sure that you've fully separated the two sides before you start kind of pulling it to see that you've kind of opened it all up. Basically, don't pull it. Once you've opened up, once you've moved it a little bit, don't start pulling it in order to then open up the rest because it will just rip so you know if you wanted them to all be kind of uniform then it'd be lovely to find ones so i have done in the past they're all pretty much the same like that isn't that lovely it's just like a big fat stuffed bit of ravioli but it's what we're working with so let's get on to the tempura mix so i made a simple tempura batter and I like to do 50% wheat flour, can I use spelt wheat flour, and the rest rice flour and corn flour. So I've mixed that up, and ideally with sparkling spring water or sparkling water, I didn't have any, so I've just used tap water. And just going to dip these in. We'll do two or three at a time into some nice. oil got sunflower oil there More. Try, and try, to, try and do this big one Ooh, yeah. uh. <laughs> don't ever fill your pan keep it just right like that that's it just do those until they're crispy and kind of light golden brown so it took about five minutes and I'm just putting them on some absorbent paper oh, this one's huge
There we are, ready to serve. Kind of one per portion, depending on size, of course.